All right, welcome everybody. Glad to have you all here. So we've got May sitting in the, the great chair here. We're gonna be doing this live photo shoot, teaching you guys how to take photos for your paintings reference. And Kevin Murphy is here with us and he will be showing us how this works, looking at the camera, looking at the lights, and just setting up. We're gonna be doing a simple portrait, is that correct, Kevin? Yes. Awesome. Simple portrait. Great, so, and if you are uh, not familiar with what Evolve is, we help people get pro art skills in about 350 hours. That's about one year if you do seven hours a week. So if you're curious about that, definitely check us out. We've got a whole bunch of links in the description. And so without any further ado, actually, real quick, if you have questions, start thinking about them now, but let's let Kevin open us up and uh, let's get ready to learn. Okay, let me just grab the seat. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to take the seat. I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, just a little bit about, about what we're going to be doing here. So, a camera is a very simple tool, and it's not that different from the way that we think when we make paintings, right? So, in Evolve, we're taught to think in terms of the light, right? The camera only functions based on light, and that's very important. So, we have four particular things that we're going to pay attention to on the camera, and everything else is extra. Very important. I would recommend for those of you who are going to be playing around with cameras, get a pen and a piece of paper or break out your phone and you're going to take notes on this. Okay? The four things that we're going to be concerned with are shutter speed. And that's the, sh that's the speed at which the shutter opens and closes, allowing light in, uh, allowing light into the camera to hit the sensor. The second thing that we're concerned with is the aperture. And that's how big or small the opening is in the lens. Again, which allows more or less light in uh, to hit the sensor. And then we have ISO, which is the sensitivity of the sensor itself. So basically, we have a sensor that's inside of the camera behind the lens. And so when we press the shutter release, the, the uh, curtain pulls back and allows light to go in for a certain amount of time and then drops back in front to, to block out light. Based on how fast it moves up and down, it will determine how much light is allowed in. Additionally, the size of the opening of the aperture will allow more or less light in when the shutter pulls away. And again, the sensitivity or the ISO, the sensor is then set to a, a level of sensitivity based on the amount of light you have in the space. Okay, so those are the three major things. And then the last one is white balance. Um, white balance is just to match the color of the light that's in the room, right? So color correct or daylight correct light it's about 5,000 Kelvin. Um, what you think of as white light, if you go into, a, into a, um, a store and you buy white light bulbs, they're about 4,000 Kelvin, right? And your camera will have Kelvin settings, or it'll have settings to say like in broad daylight, in shadows. Um, but if you go into your camera, you want to go to Kelvin settings if you have them. It'll just be a letter K. And you'll match the number to the light you have. If your camera doesn't have Kelvin settings, then you're just going to match it to the environment or set the camera to automatic. The cameras, the automatic on these cameras is pretty good. It does a pretty good um, job of balancing out any color in the light. So, um, but everybody's camera is going to be different. And originally, we were going to put a lot of, we were going to put a camera directly on my camera to show you what I'm doing with the camera. But the truth is, my camera is not going to look like your camera. And if you start looking for the dials that are on my camera on yours, you're going to be really lost. So. We're not going to be showing you my camera. I'm just going to be talking about these things as I go. And you're going to be able to see through the camera what happens when I change each one of the dials. So now, pens in hand. The first thing we want to talk about is shutter speed. So each one of the three things, the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO, each one of them controls a, a certain aspect of how light is registered by the camera, how much gets in and how it's registered. There's a trade-off, though, for each one of them. So shutter speed. The faster the shutter opens and closes, the less light it allows in. And so shutter speed, to shoot a handheld camera, you need to shoot at about 1 60th of a second. The shutter, so that means the shutter opens and closes in 1 60th of a second. And though that sounds really fast, you're gonna, you, if you're hand-holding your camera and you have a, a moving subject, you're going to wind up with a relatively soft-edged photograph because there's going to be movement of the camera and movement of the subject all together in that 60th of a second. I forget what the actual number is, but to actually like have a camera on a tripod and freeze rain so that it's, it's an 
you know, you can get every little drop of rain and every little splash. I think it's like one five thousandth of a second. I think that's the speed. It's something like that. Um, it's fast. Again, one sixtieth of a second on a tripod with a person kind of moving around slowly, you'll be okay, but you're not gonna have razor sharp photographs, right? They're gonna be a little bit soft around the edges. And so the shutter speed, um, in order to get more light, you sacrifice the sharpness of the photograph, right? That's the trade-off. Each one of these things, there's a trade-off for allowing more light in or for needing less light in the room to be able to shoot. So for the shutter speed, what you're trading off is how sharp the photograph is. The slower the shutter speed, the more movement you're gonna have between you at the camera and the person that's sitting. And so that little bit of movement, even camera shake when you press the, the shutter release, that little bit of movement is enough to soften the edges of the objects in the photograph. So the trade-off for a slow shutter speed, which allows you to work with less light, is gonna be that the images will have a soft edge to them. Now the aperture, the size of the opening in the lens, it does the same thing. The smaller the opening, the more light you need in order to get the same photograph. The, uh, so the, generally cameras, the lens will go from like f2 to f22. 22 has like an infinite depth of field and f2 is a very narrow depth of field. And that's really the trade-off. Like, so f2 doesn't require a lot of light, but it also doesn't give you a lot of focal range. So at f2, my face might be in focus but the back of the chair would be out of focus. Like my hand would be completely, it would really kind of soften up. You wouldn't be able to work with, as, with this as reference um, in, a, in a painting. This would be sharp and this wouldn't be. Right, and you can kind of get it. As, as I get closer, this hand gets further and further out of focus. The camera right now, I don't know what it's set to, but we're gonna be playing around with that. So again, aperture is the size of the opening. The bigger the number, the smaller the opening, okay? And so, when we're, working, when we're dealing with our aperture, what we're trading off in order to be work, able to work with less light is depth of field. What, how much space within the image um, is in focus? Again, at 22, the opening is very small, so the depth of field is almost infinite. Stuff that's one foot away and stuff that's 100 feet away is gonna be equally sharp. At f2, when the opening is very large, only a very small depth of field, maybe six inches. It depends how far away the camera is from the subject, but only about six inches is gonna really be in focus. Now again, like it's easy to say, well, why don't you just put more light on the subject? But inside of a studio, creating that much light is not that easy. If you're using strobes, it's fine, but strobes are expensive. We're trying to do this with, with, um, within, a, within a reasonable budget. And so if you're working with LED lights, which is what we'll be working with today, or if you go and you're getting just heavy duty light bulbs from a, from a hardware store and using um, like reflective cans, you're only gonna be able to generate so much light. And so you have to be able to play with the camera's settings in order to get a good picture with what limited light you have. Now, if you shoot outdoors, it's not a problem. The sun generates all the light you need. But we're talking about shooting in studio. Um, and so, and I'll give you a couple of tricks to get light later on. Anyway, so the last of, the, of them is the ISO, which is the sensitivity of the sensor. So the shutter pulls away and the aperture has a certain opening and then the light goes through. You can set the sensitivity of the sensor to register the light more easily or to, be, um, or to, to give the light a bit of a harder time making an imprint on the sensor. The trade-off there is that if the sensitivity is really high because you have a very low light setting, you get a lot of texture, what they call grain pixels and dots and things in the image, the lower the sensitivity rating, the, the more aggressive the light has to be. So it, you really get clean images there. Um, you don't have any texture or grit to the images that's not in the actual subject. And so, so those three things are basically what we're gonna be playing with. And again, the trick is to, to find the balance between them, right? It's gonna be a balancing act. So if I need a photograph to be really smooth and clean, my ISO is what I'm gonna pay most attention to. I will set that first, right? Because I don't want any grit or any texture. So I set that first at the number that I want it to be, and then I will adjust the aperture and the shutter speed to give me the amount of light that I need uh, you know, for the photograph. If I don't need a great depth of field, I'll set the aperture first at a very narrow depth of field, and then that will, I'll lock that in place and then move the, the shutter speed and the ISO to then give me the image I'm looking for. And lastly, 
If I don't mind the image being a little bit soft around the edges, then what I'll do is I'll set the shutter speed. Or if I need, if I need, the, if I need the image to be razor sharp, I'll set the shutter speed to be very high, and then I'll adjust the aperture in the ISO again to give me the image that I want. And again, when I'm looking through the camera, I'm looking to see that the image is bright enough. I don't want to take a dark image and try to open it up in Photoshop. I want the best quality um, images you're going to get for these things come directly from the camera. It's okay to do some augmentation in Photoshop, but you don't want to overhaul. You don't want to have to overhaul the values and the colors of your, um, of your image. And on, on, the, on colors, white balance is what you use to make sure the colors are right. If the lights are set at one thing, like a 4,000 Kelvin bulb, and your camera is set to daylight, um, that's a 1,500 Kelvin degree temperature. So your photographs are going to lean quite warm. And so you want to make sure that your, you want to make sure that your camera white balance setting matches the light source. Okay? Again, um, less expensive cameras aren't going to have a Kelvin rating in there, but you will have things like ambient daylight. Like they'll have a picture of a tree casting a shadow. And so if you're shooting in the shadow, you would know that's the one to use. They'll have others where you just see sunlight or maybe fluorescent lamps. They might have one or two settings for that. Um, but, but you'll have settings in there and you'll be able to approximate and all cameras have an automatic white balance if you want to set it to that and let the camera do the work. Okay, so May, I'm going to have you sit down here and I'm going to start just kind of playing around with the camera to give people an idea of what we're dealing with. So we just have the studio, the lights on overhead, they're just um, LED lights overhead. We'll be going to studio lighting later on. Right now the camera is set at an ISO of 1000, which is a little bit higher than I would want from a photograph. Generally, I like to stay around 400, maybe 500. At 200, the image is really, really smooth. Um, there's no texture at all. And even at 400, they're pretty good. Like, like, you don't have any issues. You start getting up around 800, you start to get a little bit of texture. And even if you shoot, like if I shoot and the image is 8 by 10 coming off the camera, and I printed it that size, there's no issue. But if you start scaling up an 8 by 10 to a 2 foot by 3 foot, the pixels start opening up and that little bit of texture that's, that's barely visible in an image at actual size become problematic as you, as you expand the size of the image. So as uh, my aperture right now is set at 2, so it's set at the, at the largest opening allowing the, the most amount of light in. But again, like if May puts her hand forward, you'll see that her face is in focus, but her hand is a little bit softer, I think. Can we see that? Yes, and actually a lot of people have been asking about that red, the red light. Oh, the, the, red, the red light is just part of the camera. It's telling me that she's in focus. Awesome. That's, that's all it is. Um, we should have turned that off. But anyway, so if you look at May, like you can see she's in focus. If you look at my hand, my hand as I get further away from her becomes more and more out of focus. If the camera were set to 22 as, a, as, a, um, as, a, uh, as an aperture, I would be able to stay in focus the whole way. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to dial the aperture to 22, and you're going to see the image is going to get darker as I go. Actually, Kevin, can I pause you there? So we've got an issue with the HDMI feed right now. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to cut our audio for a second while we figure out some of the technicalities of this. Bear with us one second, people.
Yep. Okay, we're back on. Hey, everybody. We are having some operating difficulties here um, with the HDMI cables feeding from the cameras. And so, not going to be able to do what we had intended. Um, we don't seem to be able to get this thing to run. Um, so what we're going to do is, I'm just going to show you how, how we work with lighting, okay? Uh, the truth is, what I just gave you in, in an explanation of how, what you need to know about a camera and, and what the trade-offs for the light are, you have enough information to actually work. Um, you wouldn't be able to see me doing it on my camera, but I, I was only going to be able to show you what it looks like when I make the changes inside my camera. But you can do that yourself with your own camera at home. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we set up lighting, right? Because there's a way of doing it. And if you do it this way, it becomes really straightforward. The key is that you're, you're going to start with a single light. And I'm going to demonstrate this for you, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to show you. You start with a single light, your primary light source. And you, you get that put into position. You look at the shapes of the light on the subject. And once you're happy with them, you then go to your camera and set your camera to give you a perfect shot based on that based on that light. Once that's done, your shadows are not going to be correct. There's going to be lots of other things you can do. But from there, what you're going to do is you'll then start adding additional lights. But it always starts with a single light. The second light, the third light, they're all turned off until, um, they're all turned off until the first light is figured out. Again, the amount of light, where it's going to be placed, the angle, the height, what the shape of the light on the face looks like, what the shape of the shadow looks like. Once that's done, you set it in your camera so that you're getting a perfect shot of the light. Then you start working on other stuff. So I'm going to show that to you now. We're going to get May back in the chair. <coughs> I'm going to kill these. Can I kill everything? Yeah. So we are in the dark. So I'm going to start by turning on a single light. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the light around. I'm moving it so... Um, I want her to look straight into this camera here. Yeah, I'm gonna, why don't I just move this camera? Yeah, okay. We'll move that one up and hope that the HDMI... Yeah, so I'm going to gently move this one camera we have to get us a better shot. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so what I'm going to do, I'm assuming I'm off camera, right? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move, I'm going to move this light. I'm going to show you, when I, when I grab the other light, I'll show you what the lights look like that we're using here. Um, but anything that generates light will work for this. Um, when I first started out, I didn't have good lighting. You can go into Lowe's or Home Depot and get, um, get a, a, like for $15, it's a small reflective, um, like half dome, and put a good powerful bulb in there and you'll be good to go. You'll be able, especially, particularly for portraits. You don't need a lot of light. Um, you don't need a lot, of, a lot of fancy lighting in order to do it. And so again, if, you, if you're staying on a tripod, um, you know, put your camera on a tripod, you don't have to worry about your shutter speed too much. Your subject's not running around. They're just kind of sitting there like me, making faces, looking left and right. I'm <laughs> completely inert, but OK. Yes. <laughs> Let me know when we're ready. Good? Okay, so what I'm looking for right now on May's face, I have, a, I have a controlled amount of light kind of shining at her. And what I'm looking for is to get some light and shadow. I want a relationship between light and shadow. And everybody in the Valve program has seen the reference material that we use. We're always playing with light and shadow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this close to her, and I'm going to slowly rotate it around her until I can see the shapes of shadows on her face that I want. And they're going to be awfully dark. I'm going to raise the light up a little bit. Right? And so moving it around her, like if she were the center of a clock, moving it around her from 12 o'clock to 11 to 10 to 9 is going to change where the shadows are. Right? So I'm actually going to start. Let me see her. Like, this is lit at 12 o'clock, 11, 10. It's about 9 here. You can see the shape of the shadow changing on her face. right? I just want to take a look and see what I've got. So what I'm looking for in a portrait, you see that little bit of light on her eye, I want to get a bit of a triangle on this cheek. So to set up a portrait, just again, this is just a starting point. I want light in here. And so I want to get a little bit of a shadow under her eyebrow, um, in her eye socket. So once I have it turned to the side and I see I've got that triangle starting, 
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the light kind of above her head to account for, um, I want to get the light above her eyebrow or above, above the, the ridge of her, um, her eye socket. The higher I go, the more it casts a shadow underneath that eyebrow inside of the socket. Right? And so we start to set her eye into a shadow. Just close your eyes real quick. So the higher I go, so she doesn't have a very deep brow, but um, the higher I go, the more shadow I get in here and even under here. But you see I've got this triangle in here. So this is a good structural um, light. You can make out everything about her face. There's an, a lot of dimension in it, right? So you can see her nose is clearly defined, her lips, her chin, her jawline, the, the shapes of her eyes, they're all there. Every, every aspect of her face has some light and some shadow on it. One side is lit better than the other. The shadows on, on the far side of her face are very dark. So what I would do here is I would then set the camera for this light, right? My, this light would be at its brightest setting. It's as close as I can get to her without becoming harsh. And I would set the camera to make this, at least what's in the light, a perfect photograph. And with a digital camera, you can take a quick shot and see how it looks. I know that if I take a shot of her like this, everything that's, not, everything that's in shadow on her face is going to be pitch black. And so that's really going to be quite ugly. So once I've got my first light set, and the camera is set to account for that amount of light, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move over to the other side, and I'm going to fill the other Actually, side with a very soft light. May I interrupt you? Yes. It'd be really cool if we could see the, the light go up and down again while we're watching. May I was kind of showing the other camera. Okay, I'm, I can pull it out here and kind of show the light. I was going to do that. Sure, okay. Yeah, we'll do it again. So, this is what the light looks like, the ones that we're using here. It's an LED panel. These, you can get them. They're pretty inexpensive. We have a good view of this. Yeah, so it's an LED panel, and this is, these are reflectors. These control the, the beam of light. If I want to make it tighter into a smaller space, I can do that so it doesn't just flood everywhere, or I can open this up and just let it fill the room. Okay, um, and all there are is a bunch of little, little LED lights in here, but they're pretty powerful, and you can get these. They're not that expensive, and it's just sitting on a pick stand. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to turn it towards. So I'm going to pull it back. I don't want it too close. Oh, you wanted to see this thing going up and down, right? So, and just with a pick stand, I'm just, just kind of raising this up or down. Oh, this is the... Oh, sorry, actually, we saw that on the other side. What I'd like to see is how the light affects her face as it goes from oh, top to bottom. Oh, okay, so I'll... Um, Thank you. Yeah, okay. Good. So I'm just going to bring the light down slowly. And so you can see, as I bring the light down, you'll see how the shape of the shadow changes. It's still on the far side of her face, but as I get lower, Anything, anything that would be blocked, like, so under her nose is now lit, right? So you can see light in here now, even like under her chin. So like in here, there's just a very small shadow. In here, there's almost no shadow. And look at the cast shadow coming off of her nose over here, right? So when I raise this, watch how that shadow migrates. Shadow under her chin gets stronger. You can even shadow, look at the shadow on her shoulder being cast by her chin, how it moves. You can see the shadow under her nose. But just by moving the light up and down, I can change the shape of the shadow. Is this bright enough? Just asking. It's more than enough light? Okay. So. We can go brighter if you want. Okay. I mean, I can really kick this up. It's not, uh, it's not very bright at the moment. Good? Okay. So, so I'm putting up nice and high because I want to get some shadow inside of her eye socket. Again, I've got a nice shadow. I'm looking at the angles of the shadows coming off of here, under her nose, off the side over here, and then a little bit of shadow in here and in here. And that's going to give me some nice dimension, right? So again, when you think about the images that we use in Evolve, we're always looking at the shape of the light and the shadow. And so you can see, this is very strong. This is a very, very strong lighting scenario. The structure of her head, the cheekbones, the, the turn in her forehead, even the structure of her chin, her mouth, it's all quite distinct. Now, of course, if you look at her nose, you're kind of losing the shapes of her nostrils. Her eyes are hidden inside of shadows now. There's a lot of lost information. 
I set the camera based on this. And again, not on the whole scene. So the camera can't be set to automatic because it'll try to average all of this. The camera has to be set to manual. <coughs> Once it's set to manual, then you, have to, then you have to do it yourself. You have to set your, your aperture, your ISO, and your shutter speed yourself. But from here, what I want to do is I want to now add a second light. Once my camera is set and, it's, and I've got a good, clean read on that light, it's proper exposure, I take a picture, I get a beautiful read on the light. Now what I want to do is add a second light, which is going to fill, that's way too bright, which is going to fill the shadow. So I'm just going to turn this off. So all I do is add a little bit of light. And so this, again, much like the first light, has to be adjusted. I feel like I want the shadows to be a little bit stronger. So this, this light is currently at its lowest setting. So I can just turn the light away a little bit and I get a slightly darker shadow. In here, right now the light is low. The light is at about this height. So it's filling everything equally on her face. If I raise this light up, we'll start to get inside of the shadows, all of the planes that are facing down, like the bottom of her nose, down here, in here, are gonna be blocked from light and so the, 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 the shapes of shadows on her face, on the flat areas. Kevin, you'll have to get down a little bit lower. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So if I, I'm going to do this again. So right now the light is a, it's just a little bit above her head. So all of these shadows are being filled evenly. In order to, to, to break the shadows up and give them a little bit more, um, to describe the turn and the form a little bit more, what I want to do is I want to get the light up high enough that underneath her nose is blocked, that this light doesn't fill this shadow, but it fills the one on her face, right? So the one on her nose would stay dark. And the way I do that is I just have to get the light above the tip of her nose. And that'll make, that means this will stay dark, but this will get some of the fill light. Same in the eye socket. If I can get this above, uh, above her eyebrow, this plane which recedes will stay dark, but the frontal plane will still be catching light. And I can do that everywhere. Basically, all of the receding planes that are this way, if I can bring this light up high enough, those, those receding planes will stay darker, and then the frontal facing planes will catch some of the light. And so you'll get a little bit more character instead of kind of flat shadows. So I'm gonna raise that up. And if you watch under her nose, or you watch under here, you'll see how these things darken. Some planes darken, the ones that are facing down, and the ones that are facing, that are facing straight forward towards the camera, those are going, to, are going to stay illuminated. And so, and all we're doing is getting a little bit more character inside of the shadows by, by creating multiple values, right? And it's not drastic. It's just a little bit of light. Just a little bit of, a light, uh, of light. So now that it's up high, this is catching light, but in there it's not because her nose is blocking this. Um, so again, the flat plane of her face is getting light from here, but underneath, because the light is up high, isn't. The light's hitting this, but it doesn't wrap around. It's kind of going, hitting the flat plane of her face, but not in here. And again, under her chin will be darker than in front, where if the light is down low, all of this gets hit with light equally with the fill. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, this is really, you know, it's funny, we do this. Everybody wants to know photo photography. I just showed you everything I teach my students when we do the photography session for full timers. The only thing that I would add is that if I want to add a little bit of drama, I can add another light back here. We don't have space, but I put it about 10 feet behind her and create a raking light, which would bounce off of her and run straight into the camera. And that will give me an edge light, which you see that in movies. They call it 20th century lighting. So you get like, you have a light on one side, you have a shadow on another, and then that shadow has a really harsh light. But that light is from behind, and it bounces against, um, can we do that? Yeah. All right, let me see this. See if we can add that in just a little bit. Right, so you have to stay, I'll stay right where you are. Let's see if we can get that in. Like, so you can see there, just pull your hair back over your ear. So by adding a light in from this side, you can see how that becomes pretty harsh. And this is no brighter than the other lights, it's just that the angle of it is bouncing back into the camera. So you can see that. 
And that's a way of compressing the shadow and adding a little bit more structure. But this is what they call 20th century lighting. It would just be one more light back behind her. And again, the height of it changes what, you know, the height or where it's placed. This is gonna fill the shadow, wipe some of the shadow out, where back here you get this real kind of raking light and it becomes a harsh edge. And again, even like you can see how, how detailed her ear becomes from this, right? But even like the red in the ear, like, so, I'm assuming that looked okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was all readable. readable. So, anyway, but so going back to what I was saying, the idea is that when you set up, you have to start with one light and you have to sculpt the light, right? You basically, you want to see what it looks like on the face. You're never photographing a face. What you're photographing is the light bouncing off of the face. And so the first light goes on and you move it around until you're happy with the way the subject looks. That the light and shadow have to, again, not how bright or dark, but the, the shape of the light where it's hitting the face. Move the light up, move the light down, move it around, right? And so if you want half the face in, in light, then you move the light further around. If you want more, like this right now is like two thirds lit, one third shadow, which is a really good starting point. This is like Rembrandt lighting. This is a really good lighting scenario to start with. And again, the light in front is gonna change everything. Raising the light up really high overhead will change things, right? I'm, I'm actually gonna, um, I mean, I think we're okay with what, I'm, what I've shown you here. I'm going to move this light and kind of put it overhead. I'm going to move it around so you can see how, how much she changes, or how much those shadows move when, when this light is put overhead. Let's see if we can do this without dropping it. So I'm going to bring the light around the front. And again, it's a good thing if you're, if you're trying to learn how to do this, it is a good thing to have somebody sit for you, and at the same time to have another person who can move lights for you while you watch what's happening. You can direct somebody to move a light a little bit more to the left or a little more to the right. So this, I'm gonna turn the fill light off again. So you can see the light is now pretty much in front of her and way up high. It's far enough back that we're getting light again. She doesn't, she doesn't have deep recesses in, so, in her eye sockets, and so you're seeing a lot of light in there, but you look under her nose, um, the light is far enough, again, it's, it's on an angle, so you can get an idea. If I, want, if I want that shadow to be longer under her nose, I'll just bring the light in. In fact, I'll do that, but we're pretty well centered. You can see the shadows on the sides. Um, you can see the planes, the structure of her skull this way. If I bring this in, you'll see the shadow under her nose will get longer and longer, okay? So you can see there's more structure, like her cheekbones become much more dynamic like this. You can even start to see, um, you can even start to see shadows coming in under her eyebrows, right? And so, but again, like little bits of movement. Do you, you mind don't... moving the cord that's coming down? What was that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> right, so, but the idea is that you have to get comfortable moving the lights around and see what they do. So again, like, so here we have one lighting scenario. The shadows are very dark. So on one side, maybe I illuminate them and I leave them dark on the other, right? And so this gives me multiple shadow values. This, you have central light, it explains the structure of the head. This side is illuminated in the shadows and the other side isn't. And so you have, you have a lot more personality to the shadows. And again, this would have to fit into a scenario, like your scenery, the, what do you have going on around you would also contribute to this. If you're, if you're planning on taking a photograph of somebody and putting them into a scene where there's a light in one place and there's something reflective on one side, you have to account for that when you place your lights to try to mimic um, the, the scenario you're placing the figure in. So, yeah, just put it, it would just put it over here. So, and again, with my fill light, I can add more or take it away, right? I have some flexibility here by raising the light up. So again, if I raise the light higher, the shadow under her neck changes, the shadow under her nose changes, right? And this, isn't, and this is not my primary light, this is just a fill. But it's like, again, if I turn the fill off, those shadows become really strong. So this fill light does have the ability to have a significant impact. Anyway, going back. Again, the further away the light is from the subject, the softer the light will be on them. And again, so here, just bringing this around and getting back to that 
Rembrandt type lighting. Again, so that's good again. But the idea is you're looking for, depending on your subject, you're looking for strength in the lighting or subtlety, right? So this is very strong, like mostly you wouldn't paint a woman under this kind of lighting. The light to shadow ratio is way too harsh. And so you would want to definitely do a fill, right? So like, I might be okay under this light, but May isn't. <laughs> right, so, right, because one, because I'm an older male, the structure of my head, it, it allows for this kind of, a, I mean, almost cruel lighting. It's, it's very harsh. But for somebody who has, who has softer features, somebody who's more elegant, you wouldn't want this, right? And so you, under most circumstances, you would not paint a, a, a woman under this kind of lighting. I mean, even a guy, like a stern looking man, you could get away with this. But again, so once, you, once you've got that structural light in place, again, again, you see it on both faces, like how it looks, right? I'm more angular than she is. I have deeper recesses. And so you can see the difference in the lighting. It's the same exact light, but you can see the differences, right? right. And so, so um, obviously your subject matters. There's no one size fits all lighting scenario. What I'm giving you here is a bit of a, a starting point. And I would say um, from the camera, the light is a, a, little bit, a little bit further than 45 degrees. Like if I'm looking at the camera here, 90 degrees is here. The camera's at about maybe about 55 degrees, so it's a little bit closer to us, no, right? Wait. What did I say, camera? Yeah. I mean the light. So we're, we're not quite 45 degrees here from the camera. It's a little bit more, maybe 55 degrees. And we're up, right now that light is up around maybe 10 feet. And again, obviously most people are not gonna have a studio to do something like this. But I'm gonna give you a way of doing this in, in your own home, actually if you have a garage. So if you have a garage, I'm actually going to pull this light. I'm going to lower this light a bit and pull it away. One of the best ways to shoot portraits, especially if you don't have lighting, is to do it in your garage. So in your garage, you open the door and you let the light shine in. The light will basically give you something like this. And then you can just turn the model to face just enough. You want to just look straight forward. Right, so you would turn the model in, in the garage or in that space at near a window to get that first light the way you want it. Once you have that, again, if you're too dark, let's turn this away. If you find that it's too dark, without even adding another light, what you do is you take, you just get a white board. Like this is foam core. And I can use this to bounce that light back into her shadows. And again, if it's up high, or if it's level, or if it's down low, changes, right? So look at the reflection on the bottom of her nose here when this is here. As I bring this up, it goes away, and now it becomes a darker shadow. It all depends on where I'm bouncing the light. So even having no lights, one light source outside, and again, the sun doesn't have to be shining in. The sun is really bright, even ambient light. You come in a couple of feet from the edge of the garage door or even a, a large window in a, in a, in a living room, um, not facing east or west. You want to face north or south. That's going to be better. The light's going to be a little bit more neutral. And then you can use something like this to bounce the light back. It doesn't have to be highly reflective. A piece of foam core costs about $4, right? And so if you have a window and $4, you have a lighting set up for a portrait. But when you first set your model up, you have to make sure, like if this is the light, you would turn the model, turn, turn, a little slower, come back. So let's say this is your light, turn a little bit, turn a little bit. Now that's the light I want, eh, come back a little bit, I don't like the way that's separated. From here, chin down just a touch, good. Now I would then place this here to open the shadow up. I would kind of make sure that I'm getting it where I want it. I want it a little higher, so like this, and that would give me my shot. And again, this would be a lighting setup done with natural daylight and a $4 board. But we would be able to shoot without a problem. And again, like if this, is, if this isn't bright enough, I just come in closer. Because I'm using this for a painting, it doesn't matter if this is in the photograph. As long as I've got a clean shot of her, 
doesn't really make a difference if the photograph shows the tools that, that are used to take the photo. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop there. See if we have any questions that I can answer. See how, how badly I've confused everybody. Do we have any questions? No, yeah, people are loving this. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, are they? Really? Yeah, <laughs> love the way you explain things. I know it's been, uh, you've been kind of just going off the fly, so really appreciate yeah. everybody here just letting us uh, figure this out as we go. Um, but yeah, thank you, Kevin. If you guys have any questions, let us know, and we'll get back to you. I'm really curious, actually, May, how are you feeling? <laughs> it's nice just sitting and <coughs> not having to speak and, or paint to really have any responsibilities, so. <laughs> um, I am <coughs> I'm also a little like not sure if I should like be like entertaining or be like a very like still model so I'm kind of walking the line I guess but. Yeah, you're doing great <coughs> and then while the questions are coming in um, did anybody notice when Kevin sat down <laughs> Kevin couldn't see like he doesn't have like a camera seeing on what's showing his face but he pointed out exactly where the shadows were <laughs> underneath his brow <laughs> yeah. just to go to show the experience like he's been showing you guys uh, like he was, he was saying earlier and i know um oh uh, let's see watercolor newbies had quoted this kevin you said this i don't even know if you remember you said you're not photographing the face you f you're photographing the light bouncing off of the face to show the structure right. and when kevin is doing that he's keeping in mind that what you're seeing is from a specific angle and giving you that presentation even though he's actually at a different angle it's pretty crazy, just, to, yeah. just something that I appreciate in watching this. But we yeah. have a whole bunch of great questions. Okay, let's, let's hit those questions. All right, so. <laughs> Drinks. Yeah. Uh, first one from Dina. Um, she's asking, we would need someone to hold the foam core or get some kind of stand for it. Yes, yeah. anything. You could, you could prop it up on a chair. Yeah, really simple there. Like I said, if you're doing this, get somebody to help. Like, especially when you're first figuring it out. Right, if you can stand behind the camera, and give directions and say, move the light over there. And you can see how it looks as it's moving. It's going to be an education. You just need it one time. You need somebody to sit, that allows you to stand behind the camera and give direction and move these things around to make sense of them. Um, if you have to keep going back and forth, move something, get behind the camera, move something, get behind the camera, it's very, very hard to make sense of it. But if you can stand behind the camera just one time when you learn how to use lighting, you'll be fine. And again, it doesn't matter what, what you're using to prop up the foam core. You can tape it to your dog if your dog sits still. It really doesn't matter, right? Well, I mean, but anything, you, you know, lean a dresser, like pull a dresser over it and lean, lean it on the dresser or a table or a chair. It really doesn't make a difference. Hang it from the ceiling. It really doesn't matter as long as it's where it needs to be and it's reflecting the light at the right angle to give you the photograph you want. Awesome. And then the next question is from Lisa Harbinson. She, she asks, how do you control the shadows on multiple subjects? Exactly the same. So, so th the first thing is, like, let's say there are four of us, okay? See no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. Right. I can hold out, like, one of those <coughs> face busts or something. Right, so what's going to happen is we get further <coughs> away from the light. The light isn't going to be as strong, right? So we're going to get less and less light. But darkness is darkness, right? The shadows are going to stay. The shadows are going to stay dark. If that light is far enough away, the drop off of light between us isn't so bad. However, if that light is very close, you're going to see a huge drop off from the first person to the last. So the idea is you want to get the light as far away from you, from the people as you can, and then when you fill, you just fill from the other side, right? So and again, we don't have to be we don't have to be lit the same way. Let's say we have four people sitting side by side. The person at the end could be getting the fill light directly in their face, where May is getting it only on the side and then it's kind of middle, you know, I've got mostly on the side and the other person is mostly in the front. And it's gonna look very natural, right? Because the idea is that we see people, we see lighting scenarios all the time where, where you have three people standing in a room and the person who's closest to the lamp is lighter than the other people. We don't think twice about it. But if you look at, if you look at paintings, Old masters or even contemporary things, you can see the drop off even if even in a single figure standing from the head to the hands to the feet. Big drop off in the amount of light, unless they're outdoors. If they're outdoors, it doesn't change. But anything indoors, you're going to see a big drop off. And that's fine, that's natural. What you can also do if you don't want that 
is you can sit four people in a row and then adjust the light as you go. Shoot each one of them individually, even though they're kind of posed together. Or shoot two, and then move the lights. Like if, we're, if we take up four feet, move the light four feet, and then shoot the other two, right? And so that gives you a much more even lighting scenario. Awesome, thank you for that. Okay, and then uh, Becky asks, curious what he thinks of mirrorless cameras. Um, I shoot with mirrorless. They're great. Awesome. They are the future. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> um, and then we're asking, getting into question, what camera do you use? I'm working with a, a Fuji X-H2. We, we're actually shooting here um, a Fuji X-H2 and then um, two Fuji X-H1s. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Fuji. Um, the new, the new um, X-H2 is a 40 megapixel camera. They just really kicked that up. Um, but I, I like the cameras. I find them, they're, they're really quite intuitive. The, the lenses on them are pretty solid and they, they have a couple of functions. So years ago when I, when I shot, before digital cameras, we shot with film, all, se all self-respecting photographers work with Fuji film. And they had different types of film that had very different feels to them. And so the Fuji cameras, the digital cameras, actually <clears throat> offer those variations for the digital format. So you can actually set the kind of Fuji film look that you liked and get that. I think the, the, the new, um, the, the X2 has something like eight or nine film types from chromes to negatives to the Astia, Velvia. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them in the camera. But it's nice because some are good for landscapes, some are good for portraits and skin, but it's like you can kind of pick and choose what you like. And, um, and I've, had, I've had Canons and I've had, I've had high-end Nikons I, I love Fuji. I love their cameras. They're great. Not sponsored. <laughs> Not sponsored. Authentic. No. No. I've shot with. I've I've shot with a Hasselblad. Had a Hasselblad for many many years. Uh, so <coughs> I, I've I've had really high end cameras, and uh, I always come back to Fuji. I always come seem to find myself back with Fuji. And Fuji, in the last couple of years, has made major strides forward, and they're. Like at, at early on when they were making cameras, they would make one camera and it'd be like five years before, or even longer before anything else at the market. They're now constantly updating and upgrading and building out their line. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I really, lo I really love the um, the uh, the the XH1 and the XH2. They're great cameras. Awesome. And then this question from Teresa Beam: Will you get into photographing your portraits? And actually, I did. Um, put together a bit of Kevin's work here. So um, what you guys are looking at right now is a uh, painting that Kevin made. You can see some of the, the lighting that he's done. And um, it's a bit rough, I'm just showing you. This is the Forte Children. You yeah. can see the, the lighting on that one, which I think is just exquisite. And I'll also show you Richard Hurd. Yeah, when you're looking at those, you can see what, I, what I'm describing here. And then also I thought it'd be fun to add the Street Fighter one, since there's some cool warm reflections in there. <laughs> that, one, that one was lit from directly overhead. The light was up about 25 feet. And it was just a spotlight down on them. And, and then, then I think there was one light in front to fill the shadows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, directly from above, and there was one light in the front to fill the shadows. Awesome. Cool. Okay. And then um, next question. What kind of camera do you recommend for a beginner? Um, you know what, I, Canon makes good cameras and you can get them pretty, inex they're, they're pretty cheap. Um, you can go to like Costco and buy, if you're in the US, you can go to Costco and they have like sets. <coughs> it's a body with like two lenses. And that's a great place to start. They're not expensive, they're not high-end cameras, but they'll, they'll give you good photographs. And it's not gonna cost you an arm and a leg. Um, I mean, that's, that's what I would recommend. And probably if, as an entry point camera, Canon is really good. Um, again, like the camera that I use is a bit more expensive. You're buying a body, but then you're also buying all the lenses. A set from Canon um, that you would get at Costco or like one of those places is gonna run you probably about a grand, maybe 1200, but you're gonna have a good camera, good mega, probably around 24 megapixels and a couple of decent lenses. You'll be able to shoot anything you need um, you, you wouldn't have to replace that un un until you got to the point where you were doing pro-level work. Great. And Martin asks, do you have a recommendation for good LED light systems? 
No, not really. Um, you're best off going to B&H Photo and kind of looking at that. I have a couple of different setups. I have flat panels and I also have um, can lighting and, and you know, it's, I've got a bunch of different things. You name it, I have it. I've got strobes, I've got flat LEDs, I've got other LEDs. I mean, I've got everything. Um, the flat LEDs, I, I'm still getting used to them. Um, I'm not partial to them yet, but they certainly do the job and they're, they're relatively speaking, they are inexpensive. You can get them pretty cheap. Um, but what I would recommend is you go out to B&H Photo, it's bhphoto.com, and just go and look up their, they're called Constant Light, I think, and um, you just go and you look up their LED flat panels. You can set up a search and just look at them, see how they're rated. Um, you, you'll, you'll find what you need there at your price range. Um, the reviews there are going to be, they're going to give you an idea of what is good and what isn't. Is that a local store? It's an online, well, it's in New York City, it's in Manhattan, but they ship, they ship anywhere, like, next day. Okay, cool. All right, and the next question from Lyndon Simmons. Thanks for this, Kevin. You have talked about portraits, but are the principles the same for full figures? Yeah, so what I would say is, like, when you're, when you're setting up lighting for a full figure, the most important part of that full figure is the face. And so you're going to capitalize on, you're going to set up the lights specifically for the face and then see how they track down the body. Generally, if you get a good looking face, the lighting will, will work across the body. But if it doesn't, then you try to figure out a different scenario to light the face and see how that plays against the body as well. Right? You don't want to sacrifice and have terrible lighting on the figure in order to have a really great looking face. But you also can't sacrifice the face because that's really what the portrait is. So the face is always of primary importance, hands of secondary importance, and then the clothing is of, of tertiary importance. Right, that's where it goes, right? Um, but right, so you're looking face, hands, and then body. And of course, environment. So, you know, if you're in a room and you have lamps, those lamps would generate light. So the light that you're putting on your subject has to make sense relative to those light sources. So like if you're shooting somebody in a scene, don't have a lamp on next to them, right? Because that's a light source, and you would actually have to light from that space if that light is being viewed as a light source within the place. But again, always look to the face and the hands. Make sure the lighting looks good on them. And sometimes the light will look good on the face, but the hands are not so good, so maybe you reposition the hands rather than changing the light. Move the figuring, moving the figure a little bit changes how the light falls on them. And so if you have a really good lighting situation for the face, moving the person around a little bit until it kind of firms up and it looks good from top to bottom is the way to go. But always, always focus on the face with your lighting, um, and that will generally carry over. I, don't, I, can't, I can't think of a time where I set up lighting where the face, where like this looked good, and the other stuff that I had to say, oh, that, I gotta do something here. I might have to add an extra fill light down at the ground because things get too dark as they get further away from the fill light. So I might have to put another fill light like further out back behind the camera um, because most of the lighting is kind of focused up here as the stuff drops off. If I don't want the drop off, I'll put an extra light further away just to fill down at the ground. Awesome. And Becky asks, how would you handle the lighting for a family, males, females, children with really soft features? Again, I would have a lot of fill. Right? And so, the, so one of the nice things about painting, doing this and getting, using this as reference for painting, is that after you get your reference, let's say um, you, want to, you, the, 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 you, have a, you have two adults and two kids, and you want the kids to be really soft and the adults to be a little bit harder. So you can, you can darken or strengthen the contrast between the light and shadow on the adults and leave the kids soft. Right? And you, don't have, you wouldn't make a drastic change, but a little bit of a change will harden up the adults, make them look a little stronger, and the kids can stay soft. Bearing in mind that the round nature of a child's face is gonna play differently with, differently with the light than it will with somebody who's angular, you know, somebody who's older like me. And so a lot of the time, that problem takes care of itself. But you don't wanna have harsh light. Whenever you're doing a portrait, you really don't wanna have harsh light unless the intent is harsh light. And there are paintings that you definitely do that where you want to you, you make somebody imposing or make them look powerful. And that huge contrast jump will do that. But if you're painting families, very soft light is what you're looking for. You still have to have light and shadow. 
but you want to fill the shadow and make it nice and bring it, bring it value-wise close to the value of the lights. Awesome. And then this question from Raymond Imber. How do you compare lighting for a photo versus lighting for a painting directly? They're the same thing. You know, it's like, again, you know, when we paint, we think in terms of light. When we, photo when we do photography, we think in terms of light. It's like, I'm not the subject. Whether I'm, whether I'm being photographed here or being painted directly from life here, the light is the subject. And so it doesn't matter, camera or paint. It's all the same, right? We don't, dis we don't distinguish between them. Light is light. And the light either looks good or it doesn't. We adjust it until it's doing what it, we need it to do, whether it's for the photo or for the painting. And if it's a photograph for a painting, we have to think about what the painting's gonna look like based on the lighting in the photograph. So we're thinking painting as we're setting up the lighting for the photos. Yeah. And would you also add to that, that like, I think, you know, a lot of times if there's a photograph of something, people would just assume, like when they see the photograph, they just see all the details and they just think, oh, this is real, this is believable. Whereas in a painting, you have to anticipate that you need to still convince your viewers that it's real and believable. And, yeah, yeah, well, so, so, you know, there's a bit of a disconnect between a photograph and a painting. So like when we, naturally, our brain recognizes that a photograph is, <coughs> a photograph is um, created by a, by a mechanism, a, a machine, and so it is, it's, it's exact, um, where a painting can have human error in it. And so when you're making a painting, you have to, the painting has to be more believable than the photograph in most cases. Again, the photographs, when we take them, they're a point of departure. They're not meant to be slavishly copied. They are a point of reference for you to get going. But in the end, you have to know what you're doing to be able to, to, to take the image and turn it into everything that it can be. That's really the job of the artist. Right? So even if you're painting from someone from direct observation, the idea is to not just slavishly copy what you see, but to, 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 to capture what is most important and to discard the things that don't matter. And, and, and it's no different whether it's from a photograph or from life when you're doing that. Uh, Mark appreciates the garage light and foam core tips. Yeah. You, don't, you don't need to spend money. And the truth is, if you're doing small portraits, you could set up that lighting, and you could use a white drape, a sheet, and you could also use your cell phone. You don't even need a camera. I mean, you are going to have limitations if you do that. But you can do that. The cameras on phones these days are, the, the lenses aren't great, but, the, but they're, the images are dense enough. The color correction is good. You would be able to make portraits using your cell phone, garage light, and a white sheet. And you'd be able to make some pretty clean photos. Again, you have to practice a little bit. You have to play with it. You, but you would be able to do it. And I'm saying like a white sheet, if you want to get a little bit more color, you could get a peach colored sheet or even a red sheet and bounce the light. The light bouncing off a red sheet will be red. It's not going to be very red, but a little bit red. When you go to Staples, you can buy foam core, 25 different colors. So if you want gold or, or blue, or you can bounce that color back into the shadows. Awesome. And Jasmine asked, I'm very interested in Kevin's sci-fi paintings. How does he shoot for those kinds of settings with multiple subjects? It's, it's the, the same, same thing. thing. Like yeah. what, it, what you do is you just figure out, like in this scene, where's the light source? Is the light source sun in the sky? Is it fire on the ground? What, what is the light source? And then you basically put lights where the light source would be, ramp them up to the amount of power that that light source would generate, set the camera accordingly and shoot. And then it's like, again, you know, it's like if you have five figures in a scene. I mean, May actually did a painting recently with, um, three figures. with three figures. And you've got two up on this rise above and then one down below. But they're all lit under the same light because if they were in that space, they would be under the same light. So it's not like you change the light per figure. All of the figures are living in the same space. So wherever the light is for one, it's there for all of them. Awesome. And then a question from Deborah. How would the lighting change to photograph paintings? I think that's an entirely different that's, subject. Yeah, that is a completely cover. different thing. But I'll, I'll give you a quick overview. What you want to do is you want to get the, the lights at about a 45 degree angle away from the, the light, the, the painting on each side. You want to put them up, up above the height, probably around, so like if the camera's in the center of the, uh, the, center of the, the painting, you want to have it so that you lift the lights enough that all the glare disappears, right? You'll see the glare on the corners. As you lift the lights, 
the angle of reflection, the light, the light will bounce off the painting and down towards the ground rather than this way and towards the camera. And so you want them at about a 45 degree angle, maybe about eight to 10 feet away and up nice and high shining down. And the camera should be centered on the, uh, on the image. And again, as long as you, the idea, the problem with the lights is that you get glare. So if the angle of refraction is enough, um, no light gets bounced directly back into the camera, and so you'll have clean images with beautiful lighting. But yeah, that's a completely different thing, but 45 degree angle from the, 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 paint, the painting is here, the camera faces it directly, and then 45 degrees for each light, one on each side. You can't do one, you have to have two. The reason you have to have two is if you shine from one side, the, the, the light's not going to be able to get far enough away, and so one side of the, of the painting is going to be lighter than the other, unless it's a small piece. In a small piece, you could probably do one light. Though I would recommend two regardless. It's, it's, a, it's, it's good to work that way. Awesome. And we have a new student who joined us just 48 hours ago, Marlo. Uh, hey, sorry, Marlo. Mar Mario. My, my Mario. Pages. Welcome. Mario. Yeah. Uh, the question, though, is would you use a telephoto lens for portrait? I Personally, I prefer to shoot with a prime lens. A prime lens is a lens that doesn't zoom. It's only one, it's only one depth. Um, they tend to be crisper and cleaner. Um, you get better imaging out of them. Zoom lenses, they have, they have better, better and worse areas within the lens. Um, you get more distortion and things like that. There's a sweet spot in a zoom lens, and if you're outside of that sweet spot, for all of the cost of the zoom lens, you're not getting the best photograph. Prime lenses are always the best, and if you're working in a controlled space, you know what you're shooting with. Right, so if you have a full, if you have a full, um, a full sensor, and again, this is tech for cameras, but if you have a full-size sensor, like an 80 millimeter lens is great for portraits, 85 millimeter, and if you're shooting with a cropped lens, then like a 50 millimeter lens is like just perfect for head and shoulder portraits, but you could, even with that, you could still get full figure if you back away a bit. Great, and then from Sean Kelly, can you cover the focal length of the lens for portraiture in order to avoid unwanted distortion, such as 50 millimeter to 85 millimeter lenses? So, the, so the, the thing that you want to stay away from is, is like, so you could, you, you could shoot a portrait with a 23 millimeter lens, but you're going to be shooting from like nine inches away from the person because it's a wide angle. So the idea is, a 50 millimeter on a crop sensor is the equivalent of like an 80 millimeter on a full sensor. So, and, and again, this is, this is kind of, this is tech. Um, but just to give you an idea, like if you have a full sensor camera, then an 85 millimeter lens is like a perfect lens for portraits. You'll be far enough away that there'll be no distortion at all. Um, on a crop sensor, a 50 millimeter lens. And again, when you're looking at a camera, it'll say it's a cropped lens or it's, or it's a full frame. If it's a cropped lens, which most cameras are, unless you're spending a lot of money, uh, unless you're starting to get, to get up into like the three, four thousand dollars for the body of the camera, it's a crop sensor. And so those crop sensors, a 50 millimeter lens is really the lens. And you can even go up to like an 85 millimeter lens. You're going to be way back from your subject, like 20 feet away from your subject to shoot. Um, but but you're going to get a good, clean image, and you're not going to have any distortion. And I'm saying 20 feet. That's like for a full figure at like 85 millimeter on a crop ca uh, cropped uh, sensor. Awesome. And, and that, that's, that's a lot of numbers. If you don't know what those things are, it's okay. You don't really need them. Yeah. And then this question from Avani. Um, while painting from observation, how do we decide what's important and what is not? So that's a great question, and we talk about that in our Evolve program. So definitely check out the links. We, we actually don't teach photography per se, we, we yeah. teach people how to do oil painting and get professional level skills, teaching them the foundations of just art in general. And uh, we do that by studying the light, values, edges of color, and we get, there, we get people there super fast. So definitely check out the links in the description. We also have our whole YouTube channel which focuses much more on those kinds of subjects. Yeah. Um, you might appreciate the portrait playlist that we have, um, how to make better portraits. So you can look that up. Yeah, and I would say, like, just a quick answer to that is um, knowledge in, in what you're looking at is the start of it, but figuring out what matters and what doesn't comes from experience. Not just fumbling around in the dark, but knowing what you're doing and then earning experience, spending time working. You put those two together, you'll quickly start to understand what matters and what doesn't. 
question from Bridgeport. Do you have any special tips for photographing just kids or just pets as reference for a painting? Um, fast shutter speed. <laughs> you prioritize your shutter speed because they move. Um, for kids, you got to get lucky. So like I like a mirrorless camera because you can set the camera to silent. The camera, you can take pictures. And what I do is I actually, I will shoot, my camera shoots 20 frames a second. I'll set the camera and I'll have a, uh, a remote shutter release and I will interact with the person while I'm shooting photographs. They don't even know I'm shooting. I mean, obviously they're in the studio, they know why they're there and they know that the camera's facing them, but they don't know the camera's running. And what's happening is I'm catching, I'm catching the equivalent of video. So what I found is that if you take still photographs, click, 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 they always look terrible. But if you go and you take video of somebody, literally every frame looks just like them. It's so comfortable. And what it is is that when they're told to freeze for a photograph, they do just that. These cameras nowadays, like my camera does 20 frames a second, I can get 20 frames in a second without the camera making a sound and just using an electric shutter. And so um, I can stand there and talk to them and they're just naturally being themselves. And a lot of the photos are throwaways because they're talking, but then like you can catch them in the middle of making a smile rather than once the smile is made. And it's usually those in-between shots are the ones that are really great, especially with kids. Catching kids is, is only done by catching them off guard so they don't know that they're being photographed. And so, again, you sit them down, they know what they're there for. But if you're shooting the whole time while you're setting them up, you'd be surprised what you would get. And again, you have to get a camera that has a, a, um, a hot shoe on top that so you can set up an automatic or a remote shutter release, and that's a probably 150 bucks for that. But that's how, that's how I do it. On that note, is there an art to making your model feel comfortable in a space? Like when you're getting all this lighting set up around them and adjusting the settings on the camera and they're standing there, um, is there anything that you do to kind of... Play music. Yeah, well music, yeah. Music's a good part of it. Um, nothing worse than a quiet room. Um, you let them play their music, right? You play something that they like. Um, or you just converse with them. You help yeah, them to relax. To them. It's not, yeah. yeah. It's kind of simple. <laughs> if you can get them to forget what they're doing, especially for portraits, if you can get, get them to forget what they're doing, you can put them in position. They don't, again, like I said, quietly shooting. You can put them in position. They don't even know you're taking pictures yet. So they're still relaxed. They're still themselves. I, I'll give you a great example. So I had a, I had a portrait that I did. Actually, you showed it earlier. Um, Richard Hurd, the gentleman with the dog. So I was shooting, um, I was doing his portrait, and it was just him. He's a, he's a famous actor. And the whole time he was, he was posing for me. Um, every time I, I, I pointed the camera at him, he went from being himself to the actor. And I could see it, and I, I hated it. I really, I, I, I got down to like one last roll of film. I was shooting film at the time. I shot probably 20 rolls of film, and I knew I didn't have a good shot. Not one. And so um, I basically, I just accepted I didn't have a good shot. Now, he was telling me about this, this dog that he had running around at his feet out in LA. He was driving and this dog was like on the highway and cars were screeching to a halt to, to not run the poor dog over. He got out of his car and he brought the dog home and, um, and it, became his, it became his baby. And um, all of his kids, had, uh, his last child had just moved out and so this was a really nice, really nice thing to have in his, in his home. The dog, I still remember the dog was named Cisco. But, um, but was memorable, right? And so, but what happened is, I got the last roll of film in the camera and I thought, you know what? Why don't you pick up your dog and let me just grab a couple of shots, I'll send you the prints. When, after I get the, the film done, I'll just send you a couple of prints with your dog. So he picks up the dog and all of a sudden he forgets that he's an actor. And he's just himself, holding his baby. And literally every single shot on that roll was a, was a painting, every shot. And it was just him enjoying his dog. Here I had a whole bunch of other rolls of film, not one photo. And when I got the film back from all those other rolls, there was nothing there. It looked like the kind of photograph you'd see in the back of a book from a stuffy author. Like really, like, you know, the professional photograph with the glasses in his hand. Just, mm. You know, it's just, it was kind of funny. But once, once, he, once he just thought they were photographs of him and his dog, everything changed. And so that was, that was great. And so that's why the dog is in the painting. I, I did the dog for free because it needed to be in the painting. I didn't charge for it, so. Awesome. Yeah, I love that story. 
Um, the two lights that you use, do they have to be the same? No, no, but it helps. It helps. Again, consistency. If you have one, you know, if you have if you have a Canon camera and a and a, and a Fuji camera, they work differently. Everything is in different places. Like, so if you're gonna have two cameras, get two of the same, like the, two of the same brand, because everything is kind of hidden in the same places. Using lights, learn how to use one, the other one, you now know how to use the other one. If you have two distinctly different lights, you start running into like, like they do different things. And again, the idea is they just pump light, but the mechanisms for making them work, how the light comes out of them, every light's a little different, just like every camera's a little different. And so keep your, keep your setup simple. Stay with one brand if you can. Don't make your own life unnecessarily difficult. That's just kind of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, unless you have no, excuse me, unless you have no choice. Like if you're buying like used equipment and you need it now and it's like there's only one of that and one of that, then that's fine. But if you have the choice, keep everything simple and the same. It just, there's, there's just less of a learning curve. Again, if you have three lights and they're all the same, the learning curve is for one light. You have three lights and they're different, there's three learning curves. And again, they're simple enough, but why, why do that to yourself? Awesome. And then Linda is asking, do you find the wall color, like the one behind you, is ideal for portraits? No. <laughs> no, we shoot with a gray backdrop um, so that we have, it's a neutral gray, not too dark, not too light. Doesn't lean one way or another. And um, we basically just change the color out for what we want it to be. Neutral is best. Again, if, I'm, if this blue affects the color of, of, the, of everything, if this wall were red, if this room were red, everything here would be affected by it. Even though the lights are shining on me here, there would be a dramatic effect in the color of my skin based on light bouncing around, but also relative to what's behind me. And so neutral is always better. Awesome. And then Karen Lee asked, how does Piper do those fancy horses? So Piper is our head instructor mm. at Evolve, yeah. and she also learned under Kevin. So yeah. Well, well she's she's taken some of my lights to Barnes and photographed at night. Um, I have some of my lights are pretty powerful, um, so you can you can light a, a space like that. Um, not a whole barn, but like where the horse is standing. <laughs> but a lot of her shots are done outdoors, right? So you have the you have the power of the sun at your disposal, and so which is great for animals because you can have an extremely fast shutter speed and have depth of field, you have everything at your advantage if you're working in daylight. Awesome. And, and horses, horses their, their natural environment, environment is out in daylight. But, but I know, like we were talking, talking about, about shooting in a, in a garage, she's shooting in barns. Big opening on one side, letting the light come in, but she's still got shadow. Same exact idea. And, and then, then she'll, she'll use a light like this and fill from one side so the shadows aren't too dark. Great. And Linda is asking if we can show them the detail of the painting on the wall by Zoe behind you. No. <laughs> no. To Too much stuff, stuff to move around. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Come, Come visit the school. <clears throat> you can see it in person. <laughs> Do you not have a photograph of it? Not readily available. Yeah, so you can see just from, the, from a distance what, what she's talking about there. Um, Zoe was, what, 17? 17, yeah, 17. 17, yeah. Yeah, it's a nice painting. Yeah, um, and then Becky asked, do you suggest if they should smile or not in their portraits? You let people be themselves. Yeah, it's the point of a portrait. So. Yeah, <laughs> the idea of not smiling. So when you, when you look at the old masters, people didn't smile because those were all painted from life. People would have to hold a smile for four hours. That's just unreasonable. But when you're doing photographs, you know, teeth being in a, in a painting doesn't do anything but have teeth in a painting. And if a smile is pretty, a smile is pretty. And if that's the person, like you don't you don't make them not smile if they're if they're a smiler. So the idea is to paint, like May said, to paint the person. So you let them be themselves, whatever's comfortable. Yeah. You can see May's getting more and more comfortable in that chair. I'm, yeah. I'm so that the portraits are getting like, better. I, I can either sit still like this or I can like slouch and I hate slouchings. <laughs> so my natural state is always like asymmetrical. Actually would make for a better painting. <laughs> Just seeing through the camera here. Um, and then Pam is asking, any info needed on camera, tripod, or light stands? 
No, you know what? Like a lot of these things, I have I have a couple of different ones. I have very heavy duty um, tripods, and then I have, um, you know, I have lighter ones. Again, so if I travel and I need a tripod, I don't want to take a sixteen pound tripod. Um, as long as it does the job, like you don't have to spend a lot of money on these things. You know, for the most part, you know, just just. You know, like the best thing to do is go in a store and try it out. Or if you're not going to go to a store and you're going to go to like Amazon or something like that, just look at the reviews. People will complain if it's a bad tripod, you know, or the pick stands are terrible. But again, B&H Photo, if you're going to go to a place like that, you can trust the reviews there. Um, they, they don't play with the reviews. Um, those reviews, they're honest. Some of them are brutal. So B&H, I buy everything from B&H um, because they're great. They're great. I've never had a problem with anything that I've gotten from them. Customer service is, is incredible. Not mm. sponsored. <laughs> Not sponsored, no. Awesome. Well, we're at the end of our questions, so let's just hang tight, see if there's any final questions. If you have any questions about the Evolve program, any questions about your goals and reaching pro-level skills, and uh, we're here for you for just a few more minutes. So while we're waiting, I got to say, yesterday, May was out oh. <laughs> at the, the Highland Gallery in Lambertville doing a, um, a live painting demo. It's a, uh, they had a model come in, and she was working next to a guy who's got, he's been painting professionally for like 50 years. And um, they painted side by side, and she just did an incredible job, really incredible job. Um, Thanks. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be more proud. Made, made the Art Academy look good. <laughs> so, and well, it's so, great. She's yeah. got to work up at the gallery, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. At, at 19 years old, she's got to work up. She's, a, she's just a guest artist there right now, but um, she's amongst mid-level um, career artists, which is, which is an incredible thing. And her work, her work blends in beautifully with the quality of what's there. It's really Thanks. nice. Okay, any, any questions? questions? Um, yeah, Becky, if you can ask me a little bit more clearly what your question is, um, that would be great. Oh, yeah, I, and then, I was bringing that up. Um, mm. Let's see. <laughs> it was, like, not relevant in any way, so. <laughs> yeah. It is. It happened yesterday. That makes it relevant. <laughs> so Rich is, is just uh, taking a stab in the dark and saying, is there any one nugget that no one has asked that you'd like to share? No, I mean, look, when you're, doing, when, you're, when you're doing your photography, you have to have fun with it. You know, like, I, I've explained to you the tools you're going to be working with, but you have to be willing to experiment. Like, it's nice now, it's just digital files. You're not, like, burning film, right? It's digital files. When you're done, you delete them, and you go back, and, you know, it's no cost once you have all your equipment. But the, the key to getting good at photography is doing it, like with everything else, right? I've just, it's, so... If I explain to you how to snowboard, I just talk to you about it and I explain it to you, even show you, I, I, I show you me doing it. It's not the same as you getting on a snowboard and getting out on the snow, right? You learn how to snowboard by doing it. I can, tell, I can, I can describe it to you until I'm blue in the face. It's not going to make any difference until you, put on a, until you strap on a snowboard and get out on the snow, right? And so it's the same with the camera. I can explain to you shutter speed and aperture and ISO and white balance, but until you get behind a camera and play with it, play with the lighting, this stuff, they're just words. But you'll find that if you do that, it won't take very long before you start to, you start to find places to experiment and the quality of the photographs starts to really come up and, and be something you can be proud of. But you have to be okay, like spending time just playing, and it's best to do it if you can bring somebody else with you. And look, even if you can get one person, instead of having a, a person sit, put a sub, put a, you know, it can be any object, and have the person that's with you move the light around. Again, it doesn't matter what the subject is. We very often will use a, 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 plas, a plaster um, cast, a bust of some kind, or we'll, we'll have like the Belvedere torso, and we'll just move the light around that when we're first learning to see how the light interacts with the subject. It's not a portrait, but it's the same thing. If you can light, if you can light a ball and a can and a cube and make it nice, you can, you can light a portrait. If you can photograph an, a simple objects, you can photograph complex objects. It's all the same, just more of it. So experience is king. I find that like recently I've been 
you know, I was like practicing with live models and stuff. It's actually been like pretty helpful. Like just yeah. like it's it's just like one light, but like still getting practice, like adjusting it and getting what I want is helpful. Yeah. And Mark is asking, do you charge per person for your paintings? Yes. Yes, when I do portraits, it's per person. And then it's, then it's additional for complexity, right? There are standard rates, and then if the painting is much more complex, then there'll be, there'll be additional charges. Like for if that. there's like sequins, you know? Like yeah. What, what was that? Like a paisley? Like oh, metallic, metallic paisley yeah, like jacket. What, yeah. what is that, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, but no, it's generally there are standard fees, which are for standard portraits, and it's, the set, it's a set fee for each figure. And then if there's added complexity, like above and beyond what's reasonable, that's going to eat up the clock, that then that gets added on as well. Yeah, but the bottom line is like time, right? Right. It, it all depends on how much time is being spent. Like, so I figure for a, a, a three-quarter figure, it takes me about 25 hours. I did one recently that took me about 40 hours because of the level of complexity of what the guy was wearing. <laughs> so I would charge in line <clears throat> with that 40 hours based on what I charge for the 25. And then this question from Dina, do you think using a mirrorless camera for photographing a painting is preferable over using a cell phone or a smartphone? Oh, yeah, yeah of course. Your cell phone has a, has a lens. So the, the, the camera itself is actually the, the least important part of the photograph. It's the lens, it's the glass. You can have a mediocre camera and a really pe good piece of glass, a good lens, and get incredible photographs. And if you have an incredible camera and a bad lens, the photographs are going to be terrible. The lens on your camera is garbage. It's, I mean, it's, it's barely the size of a fingernail. It's, it's a terrible lens. 24 megapixels is just is the size of the image it creates, <laughs> but the lens is terrible. So yes, you would want to shoot. And you're saying mirrorless. Any digital um, a DLSR, um, SLR, will be fine, <laughs> right? You don't have to go mirrorless. Any digital camera will suffice. And again, a camera that has removable lenses is always going to be preferable to a point and click, like these little cameras with the thing that slides out and you take a picture. That's not going to give you a great photograph because that lens is not much bigger than what's on your camera. You need a lens, good piece of glass. Three-dimensional. Also. Yeah, the lens, the lens should protrude from the camera. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All you. <laughs> yeah. Again, if you can afford it. If you can't, then you work <laughs> with what you have. That's always the bottom line. You work with what you can. If you can't have, like when I first started doing stuff, I didn't have a good camera. I didn't have good lighting. I worked with what I had. And as I started to make money at it, it became important that I have a proper camera because it, it helped the quality of my work. More better reference material made it easier to make better paintings, and so as I got as I started making money, I invested in equipment, but I didn't I didn't spend that money right up front. I waited until I was making some money using the cheap stuff, and then when I actually got good equipment, I appreciated it, and the quality of my work kicked up quite a bit. Awesome, for landscapes, is there a preferred way you like to take photos? Is it like during the noon time or morning, sunset, and what would the reason be? And what would the settings you use for cameras be to get the shadows and lights, but not too dark? Yeah, so oh, for starters, I don't do landscapes. I don't go outside. I think this summer, I, I saw the sun once. It was, um, it was quite sad, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't get out. I don't do landscapes. There's a um, lot of lamentations over the summer. <laughs> yeah, my days are long. I don't, I don't do a lot of nature, and so, um, it, it looks nice, you know, <laughs> out my window. I have a vitamin D deficiency. Um, <laughs> yeah, but... Um, I'm suffering, but, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but, you know, all of these things are preference. Like, if you, if you, like, if you like fields of grass, and you like them when the sun is setting, and, the, yeah, and the, when the sun is setting because of the orange cast, well, then that's what you like and that's what you shoot, right? So you, you find things that, that resonate with you, and those are the things you do. Um, I have shot outdoors, but it's mostly as backdrops for paintings that have figures in them. They're, it's not for the sake of the image, the outdoor image. And so, uh, again, if you, if you like landscapes, you just you find the stuff that you like and look at what it looks like during the day. I mean, I've photographed, I have paintings of, 
um, of these few girls on their horses, and they're shot at, at different times of the day. Like two of them are shot very, very early in the morning, so we have light like this. And then one was shot just before the sun went down, and that was a nail biter because the sun it gets orange and then it falls out of the sky into darkness. And so trying to shoot her on her horse while the sun was going down and still having some ambient light was a bit of a challenge. Um, but that lighting scenario, again, I'm using natural light, watching the, sh the shift in temperature. I was out the day before looking at where the sun was so I knew exactly what time I had to be there ready to shoot. And so I thought of the, I thought of the sun the same way I thought of setting up my own studio. It's just a light I couldn't move, but I had to know where it was and what it was doing at what time. And so, um, but I was able to get those shots and I was thoughtful about, again, the color of the light, but it was more for the, for the, for the, for the people sitting on the horses, not the background itself. So yeah, but you do it like, to your taste. And again, like what the morning light, morning and noon and evening, those, the light looks very different coming from the sun. And every day is a little bit different. Some days the sunsets are rich, they're like, are like amber, and other days, not so much so. Right, it's like going outside. I, I, I see, the only thing that, I, that I, I find interesting to like photograph, but it's hard, is fog. Every once in a while, I get these oh, yeah. really beautiful airs just filled with fog. But the thing is, I don't have my camera with me, and I'd love to shoot them, because they'd be really nice backdrops for paintings. But, like, that I find interesting. Um, that's about it. And I, like, I mean, there are some things that I, like, visually I like to see them, but not to photograph them. I Again, painted you in fog. Yes. Jacket. Yes. <laughs> that was fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but personal preference is really the thing. Mm -hmm. Is it also about like the uh, ambiguity? Oh. <laughs> <coughs> awesome. And Lyndon Sim says, "Thank you, Evolve team. This was a lot of fun. Really looking forward to finishing block two, so I can move on to the next. This has been really helpful as my preference would be to paint portraits, and we're just getting lots of appreciation here." in the comments. So thank you everyone. Uh, well, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. It was a bit of a, a bit of a circus here today. So, but hopefully it was, it was helpful. Yeah, certainly. Great. All right, well, I think we're wrapping up here. So Great. thank you everyone cool. again. Thank you very much. If you'd like more Evolve content, just check out the links in, links in the description. Go check that out. And we're always uh, gonna be trying to do these weekly if we can and staying in touch with you all. Take care. Have a wonderful evening.